Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 22nd episode of the Biologic Podcast. Today, I'm going to be going into detail on divergence and speciation. I discuss the mechanisms through which evolution affects populations over time. Specifically, I discussed how mutations create new alleles by introducing random changes to gene sequences or chromosome structure, how genetic drift pushes allele frequency up or down with random fluctuations, how natural selection calls the unfit to sculpt a more adapted population, and how gene flow connects populations of a species through wandering individuals who leave one herd or flock and go join another. Divergence and speciation occur when gene flow in a population slows to a halt. You see, when gene flow occurs between populations, it allows the populations to share and maintain a a consistent genome. They're all genetically similar enough that they can all interbreed and produce fertile offspring. In effect, they're all the same species. But when a gene flow in a given population stops, and that population is no longer receiving genes or sending out genes, They're cut off, you know, they're isolated in the wilderness. Individuals from other populations are no longer able or willing to come and mate with individuals in the isolated population. If natural selection, mutation, and genetic drift continue to influence the gene pool of the isolated population, but gene flow never reconnects the population to any other population groups, then the stage is set for divergence and evolution. Without the input of genes from other populations, the isolated population begins to go down its own evolutionary pathway, distinct from the populations it used to interbreed with. In effect, the isolated population is diverging. It's like taking a sample of a group of bacteria from a a colony in a petri dish and putting it in a whole new petri dish. That whole new colony is going to grow and it's going to be isolated, you know, on its own. But in the real world, we have, you know, it's not a petri dish. We've got environmental pressures, we've got selection pressures, and all of these things shape the direction that the isolated species goes as far as evolution is concerned. It starts with divergence, and this divergence takes place over literal evolutionary lengths of time. As the gene pool of the isolated population slowly reacts to its isolation, it becomes increasingly different from the original gene pool, the species gene pool, you know, the one shared by all the populations in the original setting. The random fluctuations of genetic drift will inevitably push a few alleles to fixation or deletion, while natural selection will shape the population to their specific habitat. Mutation generates a genetic novelty in the background, and this slowly fuels or stokes the evolutionary fire. Since there's no gene flow, these new alleles and adaptations don't get shared with other populations. They're just accumulated by this isolated population, and it makes them increasingly distinct from their cousin populations, both genetically and morphologically. Occasionally, uh, one or two individuals might be able to make it out of isolation to breed with a different population, although this rare case of gene flow in a diverging population will really do nothing but barely slow the process. If the isolation continues for long enough, the divergence will continue to widen until the gene pool of the isolated population is significantly different than the gene pool of its cousin populations. If divergence continues, differences will accumulate, like from genetic drift and natural selection, and eventually the gene pools will be so different that the populations can't interbreed anymore. They just can't. They're not able to, even if individuals do physically come into contact. At this point, they've successfully diverged into a new species. They've undergone speciation. Interbreeding during the earliest stages of divergence, you know, if possible, would most likely yield a hybrid with rich genetic diversity. Such hybrid individuals enjoy the fitness benefits of their heterogeneous alleles through a phenomenon called hybrid vigor. Basically, the hybrid's parents had enough genetic difference that their offspring just had a genetic richness to them, and it it really gives them a leg up. It gives them a fitness benefit. But on the other hand, Interbreeding during the later stages of divergence is much less likely to yield a healthy offspring, one that enjoys hybrid vigor. Instead of, you know, a healthy allele variety, hybrids of far-removed or far-diverged populations are often unhealthy. There's just too much genetic difference, and it, it doesn't create a very healthy or fit organism. They have low fitness, and they have many traits that offer clear disadvantages or disabilities. Mules, for example, are a hybrid between horses and donkeys. 
Horses and donkeys are very closely related species. They've been undergoing millions of years of divergence, such that they are, you know, more or less distinct species. And yet, they're still close enough <clears throat> to be able to interbreed and produce a live offspring. However, they're different enough that the mules suffer from genetic complications, and these make them sterile. Because mules are sterile, they can't reproduce on their own, and that means that there's no self-reproducing mule populations. If there were, mules would be able to breed with both donkeys and horses, and that would enable the existence of multiple populations spanning a genetic gradient between you know, donkeys on one end and horses on the other. But because mules are sterile, this hypothetical population can exist, and horses and donkeys will continue to diverge. They're, they're past the point of no return, basically. So they'll continue to diverge until they can't even produce mules anymore. It, it'll come to a point where they're so genetically different that any mules that they uh, do give birth to will suffer from more and more genetic complications, becoming more than sterile. They might be malformed or mentally retarded, or just they might be stillborn. You know, they might even not survive until birth. So all of this might make the concept of species a little hazy. After all, what is a species? How do biologists define the term species? Think about it yourself for a moment. How would you define a species? What criteria would you use to organize animals into species? This has been a surprisingly challenging aspect of biology, because when you really dive into it, you start to realize that there are a lot of ambiguities and gray areas, and this complicates the search for a simple answer. There are multiple species concepts that biologists use to organize species. The most obvious is the biological species concept, which I just explained with the mules. I'm somewhat partial to this concept myself, as I find it to be the most objective and practical. The biological species concept posits that a species can be defined by its reproductive isolation. Basically, if two species don't really ever attempt to breed in the wild, or if they produce non-viable, stillborn, or sterile offspring, they're reproductively isolated, and they can therefore be considered a separate species. The biological species concept has two mechanisms, impediments to mating and problems after mating. So with impediments to mating, like geographic differences or incompatible mating behaviors, uh, these are symptoms of prezygotic isolation, literally the mechanisms that reproductively isolate the species before the formation of a zygote can occur. Prezygotic isolation can also happen when species don't breed at the same time of year, or when they don't breed in the same habitats. It can happen when the egg and sperm are too chemically different to successfully, you know, connect and bond and fertilize. And then there's postzygotic isolation. Postzygotic isolation, or postzygote, um, these are factors that prevent successful reproduction after the formation of the zygote, like sterility in the offspring that makes them unable to reproduce on their own, or a developmental malformation that produces stillborn offspring. Despite the seeming logistical simplicity of the biological species concept, it's not perfectly useful in every circumstance. According to the biological species concept, uh, different populations that can produce viable offspring are considered the same species. So consider the case of lions and tigers. In the wild, their geographic ranges, you know, their habitats, uh, they virtually never overlap. Most of the time that a lion meets a tiger, it's going to be in captivity, like in a zoo or a university or a palace somewhere. The lion and tiger can breed to produce a fertile offspring called a liger. Even further, the ligers have been able to successfully breed with both lions and tigers. So what does this mean? It means that if we look at lions and tigers purely through the lens of the biological species concept, we'd come to the conclusion that lions and tigers are the same species. Furthermore, the biological species concept can't be used to organize fossils, as those species are extinct and they can't reproduce anymore, nor can we readily determine their genome. The biological species concept also can't be used to organize asexual species like bacteria, as these don't even bother with hybrids or sexual reproduction in the first place. Clearly, the biological species concept doesn't go far enough in helping us determine and organize species. The next major concept that biologists use is called the morphospecies concept, or the morphological concept. Basically, this means that animals and plants are organized into species groups based on their physical appearance, you know, their phenotype, their morphology. The reasoning goes that as populations diverge and speciate, 
They possess distinct physical characteristics, like size, color, shape, or something else, you know, that, that uniquely identifies them. Like the biological species concept, the morphological concept has its strengths and weaknesses. For example, the morphological species concept is remarkably useful for organizing extinct species through their fossils. Many dinosaur species are organized morphologically. There are several drawbacks to the morphological species concept that make it one of the less reliable methods for studying species. For example, if there's a species of animal that looks just like another species of animal, the morphological species concept will have considerable difficulty telling them apart or defining them as a different species, even though they might have enough genetic habitat and behavioral differences to clearly demarcate them as a separate species. In circumstances like this, the species in question is called a cryptic species, because it's difficult to classify them based on their phenotype. Conversely, the morphological species concept will misidentify a polymorphic species as two or more different species. A polymorphic species is one which has a wide range of phenotypes. Individuals within this population might look radically different from one another, enough so that they get mistaken for entirely different species. On a genetic level, the polymorphic species is clearly a single you know, species, a single interbreeding group, but when they're viewed morphologically, they appear like a collective of similar but distinct species. Third, the morphological species concept runs into trouble because it's very subjective. One researcher may look at a few morphological differences and say it's indicative of a different species, while another researcher may look at the same differences and be unconvinced. Researchers might have different definitions or understandings of the relatively subjective terminology used in the morphological species concept, and this makes it difficult to communicate the data that enables consistent categorization. The final major concept that biologists use to differentiate species is called the phylogenetic species concept, which is like a blend of both the biological and morphological concepts. Basically, the phylogenetic concept organizes species based on their evolutionary relationships with other species and other populations. To understand the phylogenetic concept, you have to understand something called a clade. A clade is a unit of organization, consisting of an ancestral species population and all of its descendant populations. Clades are identified based on common traits shared by most of the descendants of the ancestor populations. These common traits are called synapomorphies, and the differences in synapomorphies between populations, you know, between species, is a strong indicator of halted gene flow and isolated reproduction, which led to uh, divergence and speciation. Long trunk-like noses and long tusks are synapomorphy traits connecting elephants into a clade, just like how fur and lactation are traits that identify mammals as a clade. The phylogenetic concept will look at the genetic relatedness of a clade of animals sharing many synapomorphies, and it determines the number of species present based on the genetic variety. Consider elephants. There are Asian elephants and two kinds of African elephants, those that live in the forest and those that graze along the savanna. Each of these represents the smallest clades, or distinct species of elephants. Within each clade, there are smaller population groups, like how within the species of African forest elephants, there are populations living in Cameroon and populations living in the Congo. And with uh, populations within the species of African savanna elephant, they live across the Congo and across eastern and southern Africa. These groups of populations within a particular species all share the same set of synapomorphies. They're all close enough genetically that they can interbreed. And they all share the same genes, coding for the same set of synapomorphic traits. According to the phylogenetic species concept, the populations are not separate species, but the genetic and morphological differences between African forest and savanna elephants are large enough for biologists to label each group of populations as their own distinct species. The phylogenetic species concept is useful because it's so detailed. It incorporates aspects of both the biological species concept and the morphological species concept. For that matter, the phylogenetic species concept can be used to organize fossils into asexual species, which the biological concept can't, and it can be used to identify cryptic species and polymorphic species, which the morphological concept can't. The one downside to the phylogenetic species concept is that it requires a tremendous amount of data. Researchers must have sequenced and cataloged the full genome of every population in question before they can start making definitive conclusions.
As a result, the phylogenetic species concept can only be reliably applied to organisms that are under intensive study, what with limited resources and funding and all that. Biologists try to use all of these species concepts where they're most applicable in order to get the clearest picture of what constitutes a distinct species. Taxonomy remains a stubbornly complex field, simply because of the ambiguity and inherent subjectivity involved in defining a species. Alright, I feel like I've gotten a little ahead of myself. I've discussed how biologists determine and study species, and I've mentioned how a lack of gene flow leads to reproductive isolation, divergence, and speciation, but this isn't the whole picture. When I say that gene flow is halted, what exactly does this mean? If gene flow is just individuals moving and breeding between separate populations, then how could that ever be halted? What are the mechanisms through which gene flow can get shut down in the first place? These are important questions because the answers help us understand how species begin diverging and speciating in the first place. There are two conditions under which divergence and speciation can occur. These conditions are called allopatry and sympatry. To keep it brief, allopatry occurs when a population experiences geographic isolation. A mountain range, a river, a ravine, or a canyon, even sheer geologic distance. All of these things can act as physical impediments to gene flow. They're obstructions, preventing individuals from easily migrating between populations. Sympatry occurs when divergence takes place in populations who share the same geographic habitat but they're reproductively isolated in some other capacity. It could be that sympatric isolation occurs because the populations mate at different times of year, or because they prefer different mating calls and they fail to attract mates from the opposite population, or because they dwell in different parts of the habitat, like lizards that live in a tree canopy versus those who dwell on the ground. I'll get into more detail on sympatry in a moment, but first I'm going to discuss allopatry in a little more detail. Allopatric isolation occurs when population groups have evolved separately, after having been geographically separated. This happens most often through just basic dispersal. A few individuals wander away from the herd, you know, away from the main population group, and they colonize some other suitable habitat some distance away. If the new population settles a, a huge distance away from the original population, then they're isolated by sheer distance. It's highly unlikely that a meandering, random individual would cross this huge expanse of land to find and breed with another population. This basically means that gene flow is extremely minimal, if not outright halted. This is the case for the finches in the Galapagos Islands. Occasionally, a few birds from one island will colonize another, and this is like a foundation effect. You know, it's a new founding population group that through genetic drift and natural selection will slowly diverge from its ancestral population. Given enough time, the birds on separate islands will become their own species, even with the small amount of gene flow that still occurs. Alternatively, allopatric isolation can occur when a habitat is physically split in two by some kind of event. This is called vicariance. You know, and it's, it's a pretty simple concept to understand. So, imagine a great forest inhabited by a population of brown bears. One day, the banks of a nearby river are eroded and the flow of water breaks out of the riverbed and finds a new course running downhill through the forest. So this redirected torrent of water cuts through the forest, uprooting trees and breaking apart the ground. And so when the metaphorical dust has settled, the river has basically carved itself a new riverbed, cutting through the middle of the forest. Unfortunately for the bears, this has split their population in two. When the river came cutting through the forest, some of them were on one side, and the rest were on the other. The river is too fast moving and too deep to cross, so the bears can't interbreed anymore. The bears now exist as two separate, isolated populations. The river introduced vicarians by splitting the habitat in two and isolating the population groups. The stage is now set for genetic divergence and speciation. Okay, so now let's go to sympatry. Allopatry is a pretty simple concept to understand. You know, geographic obstacles like mountains or rivers or canyons, or just really big distances, they're, they're barriers to gene flow, and they isolate populations and they promote divergence. Sympatry is a little more complicated, because the diverging populations still share the same habitat. They just interact with their habitat in different ways. Much like how allopatry works through dispersal and vicariance, Sympatry works through external and internal events that modulate the behavior of individuals within a group. External events happen outside the organism's body, and these promote divergence. 
You see, when populations adapt to fit their habitat, they evolve to fill what biologists call a niche. A niche is the place the animal takes within an ecosystem, taking into consideration the resources that it uses and the environmental conditions that it can handle. For example, a bug that eats the leaves of a specific plant has a niche as a predator for that plant. This implies a competitive economic relationship with other creatures in the habitat who eat that plant for food, or who use that plant for shelter, or who use the plant as a host for their larva, or who have a symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationship with the plant, or you know anything else. If the population of bugs eats the leaves of the plants, the collective effect of their consumption will deny the plants to other populations who use them for shelter, or as hosts for larva, or whatever. As a result, the actions of one population force responses in other populations of other species. As all animals and plants share resources and interact with one another regularly, the pressures of natural selection are at work in every relationship. It's very ecological, because everything is related and interconnected. Everything tugs and pushes on everything else. You literally can't even eat the leaves off a plant without it having downstream consequences for some other organism. With that said, sympatric isolation occurs when these selection pressures drive population groups into distinct niches, which discourages physical interaction and reproduction with other population groups. By being pushed into different niches, population groups within the same species can become behaviorally isolated from one another, even though they live next door, so to speak. For example, let's say that there's a population of lizards, and they live all over a tree, on the roots, and on the ground, and on the trunk, and in the canopy. Of this lizard population, just by happenstance, some individuals generally prefer to hang out more in the tree canopy, while others prefer to hang out on the ground. This behavioral variation is a simple example of the individual variation that natural selection works with. So assume that the lizards are a popular food source for local animals, so they experience a strong selection pressure to avoid predation. Those lizards who can hide the best are most likely to survive and reproduce. But in that regard, the lizard population is experiencing two different selection pressures. The lizards who are more green are better able to blend into the canopy, while they stand out on the ground. You know, the canopy is covered in leaves, you know, it's like thick vegetation, so it's all green and bright, and the ground is kind of shaded by the canopy, and it's roots and dirt, so it's more darker colors, like browns and blacks and dark greens. Conversely, lizards who live on the ground, you know, in the dark mud and dirt, they're better able to hide if they have a darker color, like a brown or a dark green, but this makes them stand out in the bright leaves of the upper canopy of the trees. The lizard population then experiences disruptive selection, as the ground-dwelling lizards and the tree-canopy-dwelling lizards diverge into their own populations. If this sympatric isolation continues to full speciation, it could be that the tree-dwelling lizards become nimble, bright green reptiles, adapted to hide in the leaves and climb along the branches, while the ground-dwelling lizards become sturdy, dirt-colored creatures, capable of burrowing into the dirt to hide. Other examples of sympatric isolation include fruit flies, like the hawthorn and apple flies, which diverged after a disruptive selection emphasized the preference for the scent of apples in a subgroup of hawthorn flies. These hawthorn flies began using the apples as places to lay their eggs, instead of the traditional hawthorn fruit. And this began a process of divergence that continues into the modern day. Another example includes songbirds, who are attracted to mates based on the kinds and quality of the songs that they sing. Populations of birds can undergo sympatric isolation when subgroups begin exhibiting preferences for specific notes or songs, selectively breeding with the individuals who prefer to make those specific notes or songs, or who are particularly skilled at singing. These are all external mechanisms of sympatric isolation, but you should remember that I also mentioned internal mechanisms. These are basically mutations that alter genes or duplicate chromosomes. In animals, these mutations are almost always fatal, but in plants, these mutations can lead to the rapid development of new species. Organisms with mutations in meiosis can end up with uh, double the normal amount of chromosomes. These individuals are called polyploids, referencing the abnormal number of chromosomes in their cells. In a circumstance called autopolyploidy, a mutation in meiosis causes a plant to produce diploid gametes instead of haploid gametes, and the resulting offspring end up having four copies of their chromosomes instead of two, and this makes them tetraploids. Tetraploids have four copies of their chromosomes, and they naturally produce diploid gametes, which can't fertilize normal haploid gametes. The biochemistry of the diploid and haploid gametes 
just doesn't lend itself to proper fertilization, and so tetraploid and diploid plants of the same species can't reproduce. This means that the tetraploids aren't really even the same species as their parents at all. They're an entirely new species of reproductively isolated plants. There are new species that emerged immediately with one generation, just through a genetic mutation. Another rarer form of this exists, and it's called allopolyploidy. This involves diploid and haploid gametes that somehow manage to fuse and fertilize, and they produce a triploid offspring. This process is a little more complex, so I won't go into too much detail, but basically, these triploid plants, with three copies of the chromosomes in their cells, can produce both haploid and diploid gametes, which makes them a strange, trans-species plant lineage, able to mate with other plants who have diploid or haploid gametes. Okay, so now that I've established what species are, how they become isolated, and how they diverge into new species, I think there's only one thing left to ask. What happens if two populations that have been diverging for a long time are suddenly able to interbreed again. This happens a lot in nature, and there are several possible outcomes, depending on the extent of the divergence and the frequency of their interbreeding. In most cases, if two diverging populations are no longer isolated, like if the river dries up <coughs> and the bears can interact once more, they begin interbreeding again, and gene flow slowly reduces genetic diversity between the groups by wiping away all their genetic differences. After all, if some alleles unique to one population are introduced into another through gene flow, those alleles are now shared between the populations, and it makes them that much more genetically similar. But this clean reuniting of the species doesn't always happen. There are other possible outcomes that can happen from this return to interbreeding after hundreds of thousands or millions of years of separation. If the two populations have diverged for a long time, they might be very, very genetically different from one another. They'll have adapted pretty well to their own habitats, and if individuals from each population interbreed, they'll produce a hybrid who shares traits from both parents. Instead of giving the offspring a high fitness in both environments, the hybrids end up being poorly adapted to both environments, as they get genes that are just too specialized for one environment or another. It doesn't make a good mix. It makes them like a jack-of-all-trades who's not really good at anything. As a result, there's a selection pressure against interbreeding, as birthing and raising these low-fitness hybrids are a waste of energy and resources for the parents. This process is called reinforcement, because the low fitness of the hybrids makes natural selection reinforce the mating preferences for breeding that were the norm when each population was isolated. In cases where the hybrids don't suffer from low fitness, uh, they might be able to maintain a relatively stable population. In this case, gene flow can end up creating so-called hybrid zones, or large regions where the habitats of each parent population overlap. In these overlapping regions, the populations interbreed and they give birth to hybrids. If the hybrids are fertile and they enjoy a competitive fitness, they can establish their own populations and create a hybrid zone. This has occurred on the northwest Pacific coasts of the U.S. and Canada, with various species of birds called warblers. The Townsend Warbler has its habitat in the rainforests of southeast Alaska and western Canada, and this extends down into Washington State, Idaho, and Oregon. The Hermit Warbler lives along the northern California coasts and valleys, as well as the coasts of uh, Oregon and Washington. The territories of both of these birds overlap in western Washington, which is a hybrid zone for the Townsend's Hybrid Warbler. In this way, species aren't so much like clearly defined groups. They're more like a living gradient, like a, a spectrum of life spread across an expanse of geographic space. From these hybrid zones and genetic gradients can emerge entirely new species. These new hybrids share a unique combination of alleles from both parent populations, and thus they have a unique combination of traits with which to interact with their environment. These unique combinations of traits allow the hybrids to interact with the environment in unique ways, and this enables them to successfully diverge into a specific niche, and establish themselves as an entirely new species. When divergence is interrupted and two distinct population groups begin interbreeding again, they can merge back together into a single species with renewed genetic diversity, or they can experience reinforcement as natural selection sculpts them into two different niches. The populations can create hybrids, which thrive in hybrid zones, able to go on and become their own hybrid populations that diverge into their own distinct species. Sometimes, the hybrids outcompete one or both parent populations, 
driving them to extinction or pushing them out to new territories. This reproductive isolation, this, this great reduction in gene flow, is required, it's fundamental, in order for populations to diverge in a new species. With gene flow, populations continually share their alleles, and as such, they never diverge. When a river disrupts a population through allopatric isolation, or a behavioral change or selection pressure disrupts a population through sympatric isolation, the result is the same. The reproductive isolation seals off the gene pool in its own little microcosm, its own little petri dish, where genetic drift, mutation, and natural selection swirl and stir and mix the gene pool. In time, the isolated populations grow apart, eventually becoming entirely distinct species, reproductively, morphologically, and phylogenetically. All right, this episode was a doozy. I had a blast researching this one, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. I hope you learned something cool and are at least a little bit more interested in evolutionary biology and the mechanisms of divergence and speciation. If you aren't subscribed to the podcast yet, please subscribe. And as always, thanks for listening. to support the biologic podcast it's super easy when you open a new episode press the like button or share it with your friends if you aren't subscribed you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week you can also peruse our official store which has a ton of cool stuff like hand designed t-shirts hoodies and stickers all the links you need are in the description section below